ROTI is the accepted solution for reefing, but why? Understand why tap water poses challenges and why popular solutions produce the best tanks is just as important as knowing how to use it. Knowing where the pitfalls are, just as important as how to optimize for performance and do it cost effectively. All that is coming up. Hi, I'm Ryan, this is 52SE, where we explore marine tanks topic by topic to build our updated guide to reefing. Today, we answer these questions. What's in your tap water that could harm the tank? How do these four filters in an RODI system solve that problem? And how do I optimize each filter stage for water quality, cost effectiveness, speed, or even better, the value trifecta of all three at once? The direct answer is tap water contains disinfectants, elevated major elements, nutrients, and harmful levels of minor and trace elements, many of which are acutely toxic or poisonous to fish and coral when filling the tank or performing large water changes. Some of the type of poison that has a more gradual effect from small daily additions from evaporation and top off replenishment. Some contaminants fueling undesirable pests in the tank. The best cost and performance balance solution to that for 75% of reefers will be installing a five-stage RODI with dual universal blocks, a single 75 gallon per day membrane running at least 50 PSI, and a single mixed bed DI. Change out the sediment filter when the pressure drops, carbon blocks every 12 months, membrane every three years, and DI an inch before the color change reaches the end. The supporting evidence and answers for the 25% or one in four reefers where that isn't the case will be clear today. Those answers in scrubbable timeline chapters, starting with what are the pollutants and tap water that we care about and why do they matter. Every water source is different and has a list of theoretical contaminants or pollutants, but rather than talk about the theoretical, we're going to dive right into real life results, which demonstrate nearly every challenge reefers face with tap water via four local sources of water. Your tap water will be different than these, some better, some worse, but these varied sources are great to help understand what's commonly found in tap water and how to deal with it. The four sources include water here at the BRS facility, which uses Minneapolis's lime softened surface water from the Mississippi River, to neighboring suburbs that use deep wells, one lime softened by the city and one not, and one outer suburb that utilizes a home-based well. There are four major sources of pollution, disinfectants like chlorine and chloramines, major elements, nutrients, and minor and trace elements. Our viewpoints in each have changed greatly over the years, starting with disinfectants like chlorine and chloramines. There's a universal acceptance in the hobby that chlorine and chloramines are the type of poison that will kill marine animals in minutes to days, even at very low levels. At BRS, our water is near legal limits of three parts per million chloramines, but nearly all city water sources will have detectable disinfectants. The lowest cost and easiest way to deal with these disinfectants is a few dollar bottle of dechlorinator like Erase CL. If chlorine or chloramines were the only concern, I'd use dechlorinator, not RODI, but the scope of the challenges are obviously much more broad than just chlorine and chloramines. However, that near immediate toxicity of disinfectants to fish and corals does bring up a question as to why so many elements like chlorine, copper, or ammonia in our tap water is seemingly not toxic to humans who drink it every day, but acutely toxic to many forms of aquatic life. The answer is drinking disinfectants is not good for humans, but it's a requirement for distributing disease and parasite-free water around the city. The best practice is to remove the disinfectants with a tap water filter at your sink and not drink them. Contemplating why aquatic life is so much more sensitive helps us understand the scope of caring for aquatic life. The heart of it is the difference between drinking a glass of water and being submerged or breathing it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The exposure differences are dramatic. Second, humans also have organs like livers and kidneys that help us eliminate toxins from our bodies that corals don't. In contrast, corals will just bioaccumulate many of these toxins in their tissue until it's too much and they either get sick, develop impaired immune systems, or relent in the form of mortalities. This will become clear throughout today's video. The next tap water pollutant category is major elements like calcium and alkalinity. Most reefers don't consider these major elements like calcium or carbon and alkalinity to be pollutants or poisons. In fact, most of us dose calcium and alkalinity to the tank daily, which triggers the question of why do we remove calcium and alkalinity from our tap water only to add it back in? The answer is found in the definition of pollution, a substance that has a harmful or poisonous effect when sufficient quantities are absorbed, respirated, or ingested. You'll see why calcium and alkalinity can easily meet the threshold of poisonous in a second. What this gets at is we all want salt mix to mix up to the level state in the box. The only way a salt mix manufacturer could ever produce a salt mix with predictable levels is to assume that you're starting with zero everything. 
In the case of our experiment, we mixed up some Tropic Marin Pro Reef using zero TDS water that resulted in 440 calcium and 6.8 alkalinity, which is spot on for what they suggest or formulate for. However, when we mixed the same salt with our first sample of softened homed well water, the calcium was unchanged, but the alkalinity of the mixed salt water shot up to 26 dKH because the tap well water had a dKH of 19 coming out of the ground. The reason the calcium didn't go up is because most home-based water softeners remove calcium via ion exchange resin, but the most home-based softeners also don't remove alkalinity to the same degree. While I've never run a reef tank at 26 dKH to find out, I'm certain that it would cause rapid mortalities, likely within minutes to hours, but certainly days. An instance where carbon and alkalinity meets the standard of a substance that causes harmful or poisonous effects at elevated levels. On the other side of town, we mixed up some lime softened city groundwater, which also didn't increase the calcium level, but the alkalinity jumps from 6.8 to 9.6, or 41% higher than what the Pro Reef is formulated for because the tap water has 2.6 dKH to begin with. In this case, the city's lime softening process precipitates out both calcium and alkalinity, but doesn't get all of the alkalinity. You'll see the difference in the next city water supply, which neighbors this one. The neighboring city presumably draws from the same ground aquifer, but the city doesn't soften the water with lime. Net result is when we mixed up the salt water, the calcium jumped 80 points to 520 and alkalinity 17 points to 24 dKH, which is obviously not what we're looking for with our reef tanks and highlights the importance of starting at zero, zero. One other example is our water here at BRS, which is lime softened Minneapolis surface water from the Mississippi. We had almost the exact same results as the lime softened groundwater with no change to calcium, but the alkalinity jumps up 48% to 10.1 dKH. To get an idea of your city water's major element concentrations, test the water directly or grab a gallon of distilled or RODI water, mix up some salt and test against some salt water made from your tap. It'll be clear why the salt manufacturer formulates anticipating you're using zero, zero pure water to buy consistent nationwide or even global results. Next, nutrients, nitrate and phosphate are one of the primary concerns reefers have about their tap water. It's a legit reason, just not the one that I find most compelling and in many cases, totally unnecessary. Simply put, if your tank looks great and has a stable phosphate and nitrate level that's within your target goals, the nitrate and phosphate in your tap water is a non-issue. Most of our tanks have filtration designed to absorb and export nitrate and phosphate, so that might be the case for you. However, if you're experiencing consistently rising nitrate and phosphate and the negative effects related to nutrient pollution like pest organism growth, then testing your tap water is a good idea. We tested freshly mixed salt water from those same four sources and found that the home base well had 0.27 parts per million phosphate and zero nitrate. Any testable phosphate level might seem bad and I wouldn't want to fill a brand new tank with 0.27 phosphate, but 10% water changes would effectively only add 0.02 and 1% evaporation and top off would round to 0.00 in your tester. Whatever fish food you feed will likely grossly outweigh this nutrient contribution. Next, lime softened city groundwater at 0.06 parts per million phosphate and 0.2 nitrate, which is the best we'll see today. Even though both are measurable, they're immaterial. And from a nutrient perspective only, I would use this water. The neighboring city's unsoftened groundwater had a stunning 1.8 parts per million phosphate and two nitrate. I don't think anyone would knowingly use near two part per million phosphate water in a reef tank. Our lime softened surface or river water here at BRS had a 6.9 phosphate and 5.4 parts per million nitrate. The phosphate's actually added in back after the softening process by the city to protect the pipes from corrosive effects of disinfectants on century old pipes common to many older cities and first ring suburbs. The elevated nitrate is related to the increased organics in the surface river water source. Nutrients in surface water often swing with the seasons. The nature of elevated nutrients and knowledge of century old corroded pipes is enough for me to want to filter the water source as well. So from my perspective on the four water supplies, there was two hard no's, one questionable and one I wouldn't be concerned about using from a nutrient perspective. This is debatable depending on how well your system uptakes and exports nutrient pollution. Marine tanks are habitats that incorporate refugiums, scrubbers, carbon dosing solutions, or abundance of coral generally can absorb a lot of excess nutrients with minimal efforts. This is the value of understanding not just what you can do, but why. Everything can be adapted to your specific tank. Two nutrients we didn't talk about are ammonia and silica. Ammonia is a much more toxic form of nitrogen than nitrate. Silica is theorized to fuel some diatom-based slimes. In our case, the two cities that use chloramines as a disinfectant, which is chlorine mixed with ammonia, had ammonia in the water at 0.55 and 0.77 parts per million. Ammonia is something you can often detect by odor in your saltwater mixing or top-off bin, but can be tested for as well. 
If your city uses chloramines as their disinfectant, which is at least 50% of municipal water supplies now, know that your water almost certainly has ammonia. In another ICP experiment we did on fresh water in seven local water sources, silica measured as silicon ranged from five to 13 parts per million, which is much higher than natural seawater. For me, the jury is still out on how much silica contributes to slimes like diatoms. Diatoms do require silica to form their glass-like cell walls, so maintaining low levels can certainly be a limiting factor for diatom growth, but I've never seen that demonstrated convincingly, and even if it did, it doesn't automatically mean the inverse, that the high levels of silica are the cause of diatom problems, and more is to be learned here. That said, anecdotally, silica can be one of the hardest things to remove from tap water, and at my house, I had sky-high 23 parts per million silica, which is near twice the others that we shared. That tank certainly had diatom issues. I will share the best ways to treat for silica in tap water. However, for most of us, rather than debate the merits of silica, I'd prefer to start with natural seawater levels of silica formulated by the salt mix manufacturer in a good salt mix that can only be created if they know that we're starting with zero. The next pollutive consideration for tap water is minor and trace elements. Last week, we shared some studies where something like copper levels goes from biologically beneficial to harming the immune system of the coral to rapid mortalities. However, the range that that happens is basically untestable with hobby-based test kits. ICP may be better, but even that doesn't account for what's bioaccumulated in the coral's tissue. Many of our cities and homes use copper, or copper-containing pipes. When we tested seven local sources of water for copper, four were likely okay, but three were way higher than I'd used for filling, water changes, or topping off a tank, with approaching half a part per million copper. Just to give you an idea how this goes way beyond the obvious with copper and corroded old pipe systems, there's the entire periodic table of elements. But we found another using ICP testing of our tap water, which was zinc. There's a study called the effects of zinc supplementation on growth and coloration of stylophora, which found levels of 100 micrograms per liter or 0.1 parts per million zinc detected a considerable 62% growth reduction and loss of chlorophyll A. In our case, five of the seven freshwater sources we tested were near zero zinc, but one home well and one city source were 0.26 and 0.35, which is two and a half to three and a half times the levels of zinc that produce 62% less growth and that loss of chlorophyll. Another example of where the right concentration may be beneficial or harmless, but elevated levels can rapidly become toxic, even the parts per billion. Starting with zero, mixing the salt mixes to intended levels, a much more reliable, predictable solution. So where do these elements come from? Some are dissolved from what the source ground or surface water comes in contact with, but can also be the result of aging distribution systems in corroding pipes. Water is referred to as a universal solvent because the water will dissolve some of much of what it comes in contact with because it has a positively charged hydrogen and a negatively charged oxygen and the water essentially pulls the other compounds apart and dissolves them into the water. This is happening in rivers as the water flows over all kinds of contaminant sources and the groundwater as it passes through the rock and minerals and even in the city pipes, specifically older pipes. The net result of all this is proactively filtering tap water for disinfectants, nutrients, major, minor, and trace elements. RODI, or reverse osmosis deionization, is the accepted solution for a vast majority of long-term successful reefers, and one of the few things that reefing nearly universally agrees on. Time to find out how an RODI system treats for everything we just described effectively, and how those filters can be tweaked for better performance.